Hello and welcome everybody. Welcome to another episode of Family Reflections. I'm your host, uh, Keddy Emmanuel, and I have with me uh, in the studio here on the recording here, uh, Colby DeVoe. Colby, can you tell the people hello? Hello, everyone. How are you all doing? It's a pleasure to be with you. Pleasure to be with you on this uh, Sunday of recording. So it's, uh, yeah. Yep, uh, you guys are seeing this on Monday evening, but uh, as you uh, are aware of by now, if you've been following us, we like to record on the Sunday before. So I want to thank Colby for taking the time out uh, to hop on with me today. Um, you may be hearing a difference in my voice. You'll also notice I put a little interesting uh, filter on, on my video. It's because I have the vid, you know? <laughs> <laughs> It's a rough place to be. You know, I have I have COVID, folks, you know, a positive, with a positive mindset, you know, just yeah. chilling with the vid. Um, but uh, I'm good, though, which is the good thing, right? Um, everybody yeah. has different severity. Uh, mine, mine isn't a, a severe case. So I know That's some true. of you uh, got a little worried, but uh, there's no need, no need to worry. I'm fine. Uh, and I am ready for the conversation today. Just if y'all hear me coughing a little bit here and there, you know, just blame it on the vid, you know, we <laughs> you know, just blame it on the vid, man. Uh, but we're good. And I'm happy that uh, it's not a severe case. But I will take the time to tell you guys to be cautious, take the precautions, wear a mask, uh, wash your hands, you know, do what they say to do. OK, um, so that being said. Folks, you might you might not be aware, but uh, Colby is the um, one of the main uh, actors in uh, the soon to be released Shantae's world. And I just want to give you some context because he hasn't seen the final the final no. production. I have seen many iterations. I'm currently working with um, the good people at uh, All Biz Media. Um, as we just knock out some of the last kinks. And so I'm, I'm excited about a, a, a final product that he actually hasn't uh, completely seen yet. Yeah, I haven't seen, I haven't seen anything, I think, with me in it. At least I can't remember. It's just been, I mean, the, the trailer, the trailer obviously had me in it. Um, mm -hmm. But since then, I, I can't remember seeing myself in any of those scenes. I might be wrong, but it was so right. long ago that, that we had shoot in and so long ago that, that um, anything like that was shown to me. So I can't remember like off the top of my head right now. Okay. It, it makes me wonder, uh, how old are you when you started shooting? I think I was 16. I think I was 16 turning 17 that year um, because I was still at St. Mary's, St. Mary's College. Mm -hmm. I was in Form 4 at the time. Um, I'll always remember... I, being 16 because i remember um, when i got the script it said the person i was trying or i had to play was supposed to be 18 or 19 and i yeah. thought to myself oh i'm a little young for that <laughs> um and since then well it, it's been five years i'm 21 now i'll be 22 next year so uh, uh. Yeah, it was quite a while ago yeah okay and it's funny because it's it's interesting how you can kind of mature along the, the process of creating a film like this mm -hmm. uh, when I when I took uh, when I did the role of Owen in Nana's Paradise, I started when I was about in Form One, uh, somewhere in Form mm -hmm. One, uh, and um, we we finished the film when I ended my secondary school. <laughs> right. So yeah, uh, you, you could come in pretty young and leave much older. Uh, yeah. Even Little Shante, I think Little Shante is probably about the age you were when you initially Something started. Like that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, man. Um, but I'm talking too much. I, I want to give you the floor to just give us, give us the story of you from the initial point where you heard about Shante's world to, um, to the, the, right, the end of it though. Yeah. Um, uh, again, it's just five years ago. So it's, it's, quite a ways to remember five actions almost january makes six years so no wait hold on it doesn't matter january is either five or six years <laughs> one of those it doesn't matter um so i was at st mary's at the time i was in form four and uh, i was in the theater arts class and 
obviously, as you know, because St. Lucia has two Nobel laureates, we have Nobel laureate week. So uh, St. Mary's, because both Nobel laureates went to St. Mary's, it's a big deal at St. Mary's. And we had Nobel laureate week. We always have literary night. Literary night is a show that they put on. Um, you get performances and then, so you get performances in the first half of the show. And the second half is always like a play, which the form fives do, and that's their CXE grade. So I was in form four at the time and uh, I was opening, oh my Lord, it was, it was bloody terrifying is what it was. <laughs> it's, I get so nervous when I get on, before I get on stage, when I get on stage, I'm fine. Before I get on stage, it's, it's a, a mess. Yeah. So I was opening for this, uh, for the show. I was really, really nervous. And I mean, it was fine, but I think before that, during rehearsals or whatever, I think it was, I know my principal came up to me and said he heard about this movie um, and they need, uh, well, he said white boy, <laughs> which, is what it, which is where I fall at home. So I was just like, yeah, okay, sure. I, I'll go down and see what's happening, whatever. And um, I think, so that was January. I think March of that year, I think it was the first audition or something like that. And my father took me down. So we went all the way down south. Um, and I, I I was like the only guy there who would have fit the mold yeah. for my character. But they made me run the same scene three times so they could pick a father for Shantae, um, yeah. which was real interesting. Uh, it was kind of cool to meet people. And, you know, I, like I, I, I was very nervous. I am quite shy. So it was like, wow, what am I doing here? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I was also 16 at the time. So they made me run three scenes with the fathers and then we did two or three scenes with different girls for Shantae. And I was just like, whoa, this is a lot. <laughs> um, and then, well, I, I got the role and they made the other choices. And after that, it became a thing about, you know, when are we shooting? Where are we shooting? Um, and I would get, rides to go down south and stuff so i actually mm -hmm. cooks was great cooks was amazing cooks would pick me up and take me down um and that was early on and then because we had have, a lot of scenes so uh, i'm gonna hop in i actually have a clip of you and cooks um that was actually shared on the Idol pictures platform this afternoon but yeah. i'm going to actually push it right here in the episode so the viewers and listeners So you can carry on. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I mean, Cokes was great. Cokes would pick me up, take me down. Um, and I'm not going to say that we're close or anything, but if I see him now, if he sees me, you know, we still say hi to each other. I think those rides were really cool because um, it gave us the time to build some sort of a relationship mm -hmm. outside of, of filming, you know, outside of, of the movie. Um, so it wasn't always just this abrasive relationship that we had yeah. to play on, on yeah. the scene it was always really funny because as soon as we would stop shooting then we'd start joking around again and that was always really nice um and then when cooks and i stopped having scenes together i would go down with the obvious crew um so that was always really cool to drive you know you go down south and um but filming was great um in terms of the camaraderie of the group Mm -hmm. feeling like you had a you I never felt you know overly pressured or anything I mean there were there were times and I'm sure you must have heard I struggled badly with romantic scenes badly I'd struggle with when they want a specific facial reaction or they want mm -hmm. you to do something and I was just like whoa this is difficult 
But for the other things, like being scared or being sad, I mean, I was, I was great. We took like mm-hmm. one shot <laughs> for a lot of them. I was really, really good at it. Yeah. Um, why, why, always, why was there that struggle, if you, if you remember? I, I don't know, to be honest. And it's not, it's not that it was because of the person I was acting with. That's not mm-hmm. it at all. Because when I was up as Arthur, um, I was in the school play my second year, and I had another similar scene and I struggle with it I struggle I struggle <laughs> I remember my director was like you have to do this I was like I know I have to I just it's very difficult for me to do it yeah, yeah. um but no it was always really nice the, just the camaraderie you know you, you, you as soon as you get out the vehicle or you know you're there you get getting dressed everybody making jokes and you're very I, I was always very comfortable with everyone so it was always nice uh, it was always fun to get dressed and come out and everybody was, oh, look at that, you know, you get the reaction of look at him in his clothes. Um, that was always really cool. And I mean, we had some very long days, you know, you're going to have some long, yeah. long days. I think oh, when yeah. we shot the trailer, boy, that trailer was long. It was a <laughs> long day of shooting. I think we shot and shot and it got dark and we were shooting. Yeah. But um, yeah, you know, I, I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, it's a good time. That's some really good people. Okay. All right. Yeah, people need to understand that it is hard work, right? It's mm. not just point and shoot. There's there's a lot that goes into it. Um, acting itself is, is a very interesting craft. Um, but I kind of want to take it from the top, right? Because you mentioned that you were at a performing arts event, right? Mm. Um, so it sounds to me like you always had an interest in the arts and the performing mm-hmm. arts is that true can you walk us through that oh yeah most def um or most definitely <laughs> <laughs> i um like so i am very shy let's start there i'm very yeah. very shy but i i don't know what it is and i've actually had this conversation with a few people since it seems to be a common thread amongst or among um actors theater people if you will mm-hmm. We are very shy and socially awkward, <laughs> but we get on stage and it's something completely different. Right. It's, it's this other avenue to express yourself. You feel, I, I, I really wish I could put it into words, but I can't, I don't know how to do it. Mm-hmm. I think for me, sometimes my mentality changes when I'm on stage because I can't go up to somebody and start a conversation. I cannot do it. You could pay me, I can't do it. It's terrifying. Mm-hmm. But I always feel like when I'm on stage, you all have come with, for the sole reason to watch me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you go in to watch me and it's, it's never that I don't, have to, I don't have to talk to you. I cannot talk at you in a way. It's different. I don't have to hold a conversation with you. I don't have to feel your energy or bounce back. Now, yes, energy is very important in theater, especially uh, a crowd and the actors, you you looking for certain reactions. Some of the lines you deliver, how you deliver them are delivered specifically for certain reactions. You want to say something um, and you want the crowd to feel a certain way. And if they don't feel that way or you don't get the reaction you expected, it can throw you off a little bit. I've had mm-hmm. that before. Um, sometimes, you know, you you just, you think something is going to hit one way and it doesn't and you just like, <laughs> wow that was not what i expected and okay. on stage you can feel that but you can't show it you have to keep going um there are also the, the really great moments where because of rehearsals and this is the thing i think a little different between theater and, and acting is you constantly rehearsing 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 well not acting film sorry with film you do the scene three four times and then you don't do it again mm-hmm. when you acting for theater you have to do the scene every time you rehearse, every mm-hmm. time you rehearse until you get it good. And with the cast, you s- the jokes aren't as funny anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or certain moments don't stand out anymore. Right. But then you get on stage, and this is an audience who's seeing it for the first time. Right. And you do it, and you get these laughs again, and you're just like, oh, yeah, that was that, funny. That was you funny. Know? <laughs> and, and it just gives you this, it, in the moment, you're just like, it gives you this little boost. It's mm-hmm. a really, really cool thing. So 
I had a friend when I was in Form 2 who was in the theatre class, and I used to go and spend a lot of time with him. He was two years older than me. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, well, I want to do theatre. I'm going to, I would like to do theatre. I think it's really, really cool. And ever since then, yeah, I've, it's, I've been hooked, really. Yeah. <laughs> I love getting on stage. I love acting, whatever. It, it's, rehearsals are great. Um, I mean, they weigh it down. They really, you know, that, that play I was talking about for my school play, um, the play was very long. Firstly, the play was very long. Secondly, I was in, I think, seven and a half out of eight scenes. I was basically in the whole thing. <laughs> so every time we had to rehearse, I was constantly rehearsing, rehearsing, rehearsing. And it, it did get very tiring. But at the end of the day, I think uh, the other cool thing about that is that you build these really cool relationships with people that I guess normally you wouldn't. You know, you're not going to walk up to people randomly. You find people in a theater, uh, in a cast, in a production. Mm-hmm. And if you you spend two, three months rehearsing, suddenly you all have inside jokes. Suddenly, you know, and it's like after the after the production is another thing. After the production happens, um, you're walking around, whatever, and you see the other person. You'll just say a line from the play right. to each other, back right. and forth, and you'll just keep going for a few minutes. It's just little things like that happen, and, and um, it, it's a really nice feeling. It's a really cool kind of community because, um, and I think it's it's great for people like me who are so shy, so shy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, something that that really stuck with me from a very young age, because um, I'll tell you. I, my introduction to acting was, uh, I was somewhere around five or six. I was very, very wow. young. And my my mom was leading this group called Vision de la Vie. That, that, that's where mm-hmm. I know the pictures came from. And they were at a rehearsal and she was the wife of someone who was not my dad. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was just a little boy, just looking, just very sad. Like, is he my new daddy now? Like, <laughs> just, yeah. I, I don't Very like this, confused. you know? And I started crying. And she's like, no, this is acting, right? Yeah. And that's that moment was something like, oh, so you can pretend and mm-hmm. be someone else, right? Mm-hmm. And um, that that for me is, is where uh, I, I think there's nothing else in the world where you can literally be someone else and i don't Mm -hmm. know if you're ready for this but in only a few months there are some people to whom you will forever be jacques claude exactly yeah there are some people who is what a a friend of mine he still calls me the name so i was telling you about literary night yeah when i opened that the the show he still calls me the name of that character (laughs) he still calls it to me like he'll see me and he just says it and i'm just like bro that was like six years ago <laughs> but, he still calls me that yeah i think the the play from saatha i people now again i don't know people who really come up to me which is also kind of nice yeah. um but I, people still remember that that performance that name they call me nolan from time to time it's just yeah. i know that jacques is gonna stick oh yeah <laughs> I I, i've never called you colby viewers and listeners i've never called him colby ever uh, when when i was putting together this this episode i reached out to my mom i said i want to talk to jacques <laughs> that's that that's, that's how we yeah, yeah absolutely man um so uh, and and I think some of that also goes to the power of the character as well. If mm-hmm. you if you play a character that really resonates with people, for example, mm-hmm. uh, T'Challa, right? Chadwick Boseman. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I know there's some conversation right now about recasting the Black Panther, mm-hmm. um, but Chadwick Boseman was always T'Challa. We didn't call him T'Challa, but yeah. to to everybody he became T'Challa. And yeah. that that right there is the power of acting, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with you. It's oh, it's an amazing thing. It truly it it I don't know. I've always loved it. I remember I, I I'm probably gonna mention this play quite a lot because it's really the last 
I think it's like the last performance I had mm-hmm. before the pandemic. You know, the pandemic came in and just decimated um, the theater industry and in, in just at least for the, this period of time. Mm-hmm. But that performance, it was it was such an amazing thing. I had a moment, and I'm not I'm not gonna say this is true or it happens to other people or whatever, but I remember being on stage watching myself. <laughs> I remember being on stage, I was performing, but it was not me. It was very clearly not me. It was my body, yes, but that was mm-hmm. not me. Mm-hmm. And I could see, I could see the hand movements. I could see the, I could just see it all. And it was amazing. And I mean, it was very short because yeah. then I had to keep remembering lines and stuff. But I had that moment, I was just like, what is this? This is really weird. And it was really cool. It was really cool. Yeah, absolutely, man. Acting is something that, and I I think viewers and listeners, if you're watching this, there's probably young children, uh, little boys and girls who are watching this like, hmm, maybe maybe I ought to try this out. You should try it out. You should. Uh, you might be you might be the next Denzel Washington, the next Viola Davis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Go for it, man. Go for it. Yeah, man. Absolutely. So what are what are some of your aspirations then for your acting career? It sounds like this is something you want to continue to pursue, right? Well, I'd love to keep doing it. Um, so the um, when I was in South oh yeah, that. I knew I was forgetting something when I was in South. So the last production I did before the pandemic was in January of 2020. Um, and it was with my youth group, my, not my, my theater arts group, um, Youth SPAC. Mm-hmm. So it's youth SPAC, specializing in performing, specializing in performing arts and culture, I think. I've written it down somewhere. It's, I've had a very interesting semester. So okay. uh, I'll get that for you specifically. But so we did that we we did a, a production where we kind of took a few of Derek Walcott's works um th- those specifically with him writing about the sea and his love for the sea uh it was a very it was a great production but in terms of where I want to go with this it's very interesting the pandemic of course has been you know enormous in terms of what we can and can no longer do in theater like right now Mm -hmm. it's not very wise to have a large crowd in one place right Mm -hmm. um right now i'm at school and i'm trying to do i'm really trying to focus on getting through school and then probably getting into my career which is i would like i want to do sports journalism maybe sports broadcasting but stephen a smith (laughs) (laughs) you flatter but um i think acting will always have a place in my heart it's it's really like i said it's given me a place where i'm comfortable being in front of people and um i don't know i don't know like the statistic i think i read once that it's like one in four people are comfortable with like public speaking and being on stage. One in four, there are 7 billion people on the planet. It's like that's three quarters of the planet who are not comfortable doing that. Right. So the fact that I can do that, it's like, and then it, comparatively, I'm deathly shy. It's like, but this makes no sense. <laughs> How does that work? But I really do love, I really love the whole process, especially with acting. Now, the one thing about my theater arts group, uh, which is, um, our managing director is Miss Kentilia Louis, and Kentilia Louis is very, very special because she, I know she is going to, she was going to do it before the pandemic hit. She's going to start pushing me to do things that I don't really want to do. Stage management, writing, producing, uh, directing, things that, if I'm honest with you right now, I, I don't think I'm qualified. I, mm-hmm. I don't see myself as being this person who can direct stuff. I really like acting because it's great. I get told what to do and I'm like, okay, cool. I take this piece of paper with all these all right. words on it. I interpret it how I think they should be. I bring it back for you with my interpretation and you say to me, okay, I like this. I don't like that. Maybe we will work on this. Great. Then I get on stage. I do that. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. But because, you know, during productions, you have to rehearse and then we always go to the cultural center 
I've watched people, I've watched directors, I've watched the stage managers, people doing lights. It's just like, oh, that is a lot of stress. I would rather not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, after once you come out of the um, the actual artistic portion of uh, the film industry or even mm -hmm. the theater, you then start. It starts to become project management. It starts to become very logistical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just like, mm, no thanks. But I, I, right now, I don't know, you know exactly where it's going because there's quite a few things going on in life. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, theater, I think, will always have a place in my heart and, and I'd love to keep doing it. It's, it's, it's truly a rewarding thing because you get this thing, you get this script, and it's one of those things, man, you get a script, Right. And just, just for example, you get a script that's like two pages long, full of writing. Right. right. right? You're looking at this the first day going, how the hell am I supposed to remember all of this? Was that a script just there? Or... No, no, this is, this is something else. <laughs> all right. But it's like, how the hell am I supposed to remember all of this? The, the, the day of the performance, you remember your lines and the other person's lines. <laughs> you know exactly when you're supposed to come in. You know exactly right. how you're supposed to say it. And it's just like right. this truly rewarding thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, look at how over a period of time I've worked hard and now I can remember and, and the action goes with this word and, and this, how I have to move here. And I love it. I love theater particularly because, so you, you work really hard. By the end of rehearsals, even though you have this cool connection to everybody, you kind of hate everybody. You don't want to see them again for a while. It's just like, <laughs> I tired it, I'll go away. <laughs> You get to the night of the performance and, and you're never closer than the night of the performance mm -hmm. because it's on that night that everybody's energy is like up here. During rehearsals, the energy is always, yeah, but on yeah, that yeah. night, it's, it's just because it's the night, it's up here. And everybody's off firing at the same level and you all got this great and it works really well. And, and if the performance goes well, you're never closer. Yeah. And then you get off stage. I always loved it because I got off stage and I always felt I feel really good about myself. I feel like I've done, I've done good work. I've worked hard and I can take something from this. Then of course you, you interact with the crowd and the crowd always says how brilliantly you've done. And it's always really awkward for me because I'm so, oh, people telling me how great I am is a really weird thing. <laughs> I don't really enjoy it much. Right. But that was one thing I loved about plays. And it's another thing that, that the movie is going to change. You do a play and two weeks later, nobody remembers. <laughs> right. Because it nobody was experienced in that moment. It was and... experienced in that moment. And that's right. it. Right. You do a play. You, you, I mean, I did the play at Sir Arthur. And two weeks later, that was it. People may call me the name from time to time. But that was it. This yeah. movie is going to be in people's houses. All the years time. to come, and yeah. I'm just like, no, it's gonna man. be streaming on the bed. It's gonna, there's gonna be memes. <laughs> like, there's, there's I'm this one scene. I, I have to tell you, man, because oh, no. I, I have to say this. There's this one oh, scene, no. and it, it's really near like the epitome of the action and like what things are really, you know, uh, captivating in Shante's world, and you, you scream out, "I love the girl." <laughs> Yo, every time I get there, yeah. just, just in post-production, I laugh so hard, but I'm like, yo. Yeah. Because it's funny because you, you added the passion there, but in reality, as a man, right, even if you are in love with this, this father's daughter, yeah. for you to look him in the face <laughs> yeah. and have the audacity to scream yeah. in his face, I love <laughs> and he, he was ready to slap you in that scene. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry, guys. Oh geez. <laughs> the, yeah, it, it's it's a fun time, man. I, I've enjoyed this process. I, I wish I wish I was there in person when all of this was being filmed. It's being shot. Oh, yeah. It, I, it was I, an I, experience. Yeah, I would have really enjoyed this. Set. Yeah. I think what what was so that was oh boy. I, that scene I said it's right here it, it, it was in the um the trailer mm. but 
the scenes that I had to shoot with with my family, my my film mm-hmm. family, mm-hmm. those were always really fun because we just couldn't stop laughing. We would, I mean, there's one scene. Am I am I allowed to talk about any of these scenes? Like, uh, or anything no, like not that? with too much detail. Not with too much okay. detail. Yeah. So there's one scene where we had to we had to go somewhere and uh, we're driving around and it was just it was so much comedy at this thing because uh, Guillaume, who's my father in the play, was messing up here or messing up there, and and my mother and I had just dying because it was so funny he couldn't get this thing to move and then he got it to move and it was it was really there's little moments like that way i just i had a really good time and uh yeah it was cool it was cool oh yeah absolutely man um yeah i'm really looking forward i'm really looking forward to you seeing it um we're we're really near in the end right now um mm-hmm. I think just from my conversations with Lacan from all these, we're mm-hmm. just maybe one or two iterations away from a final draft here. So I'm really excited. I'm really excited at the way it's all falling together. Um, now, coming out of acting, you mentioned that you have your um, two more things, actually, because mm-hmm. I just looked at, I looked at the guitar I got from your neck. Um, oh, on your yeah. Instagram, you do have musician. You play? I play, yeah. I right. played, so actually, this is a great story. That same literary night, right? Um, my dad has a band. My dad plays guitar. Oh, yeah. uh, I never picked it up. Then that, that year, I was sitting around with a bunch of guys. There's one guitar, about six of us. They could all play. Mm-hmm. I couldn't. <laughs> and I sat there thinking to myself, my father has a band. There's like five guitars in my house. I cannot play. Nah, that changes. So I went <laughs> home and I told him he had to teach me how to play. So he taught me a few things and and I just kept at it. I just kept at it. And today I have calluses on my fingers. I have my own guitar. Mm-hmm. A friend of mine gave it to me. He was very, very generous. Um, so I've been playing for about five and a half years, something like that. And... Um, I love it. I love it. It's the guitar is such a wonderful instrument. It's really, really nice. Absolutely. I, I, I so I'm a bassist. Um, mm-hmm. I started playing bass when I was about eleven or twelve, and then um, about two years ago, I believe my my birthday in 2018 or 2019, I got myself a Ibanez uh, semi acoustic. And um, yeah, mm-hmm. I, I, lo- I love guitar, man. Uh, guitar is beautiful. I've been trying to learn a lot of uh, finger picking mm-hmm. things. They just sound so pretty when you get it right. Um, that's, no, that's nothing against like just regular with a pick and a rhythm yeah. song, nothing yeah. against it. But and you start to learn these intricate little things and, and it takes you a while to get it and your fingers mm-hmm. start to hurt and you just sitting there going, <laughs> why am I learning this? Right. Why did I do this to myself? <laughs> And then you get it once and it's like, ooh, that sounded really nice. And you try and do it again and you screw it up and you're just like, ooh. And, but yeah. you practice and you practice and you get it. It's so rewarding. It's, it's beautiful. And then, and then you can, playing, playing for yourself is just really nice because then you just sit there and, and you can kind of marvel at, wow, look at what I've done. Mm-hmm. So it's lovely. Yeah. Uh, I've actually told, I was speaking to some friends of mine, I told them, Guitar is one of the few instruments where it literally takes pain to learn. Like yep. when I was learning bass, there was like one day where I felt mm-hmm. a little soreness, but that was it, right? Because the strings are wow. so, yeah, the fix are much thicker and, you know. Oh, wow. But with guitar, like, especially those first hundred hours oh. or so, like, uh, you feel this, like it this, feels like. This little yeah. finger, this little finger cries every time. Yeah. You lose your calluses. Oh, those are the worst. When you start to lose your calluses and you have to look at this guitar and go, oh no. And you got to pick it up right away because if yeah. you lose them completely, you screwed. You yeah. Sitting there for two days, just ow. Yeah. <laughs> Every time you put it, it back hurts. on the fretboard, it hurts. Yeah. It hurts, but yeah, it's nice. If you love it, it's, it's worth it though. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah, man. Um, so I, I wanted to talk about that, but also, um, I I had the opportunity to sit down with Amani. You know Amani? Um, I don't think so. No. 
Okay, she, she's a journalist from St. Lucia. Um, mm. And we sat down and talked. She told me a little bit about journalism in St. Lucia, her experience, and it, it was very eye-opening. I kind of wanted to hear your journey into journalism, uh, how you kind of fell in love with it, decided it's something that you wanted to continue to pursue. So, um, with, like with acting, I got hooked not necessarily on journalism. I am addicted to sports. I mean, say it. I say it very simply. It is yeah. currently, you know, uh, twenty to four where I am. Mm-hmm. So I think twenty to five in Saint Lucia. Um, I was up last night at eleven o'clock because there's cricket in Australia being played. And uh, yeah, I'm going to watch tonight as well from eleven to about seven in the morning if I stay up the whole thing. Yeah, definitely. And this is Test cricket, right? This is yeah. this is everybody's favorite version of cricket. No, nobody likes test cricket except us purists. And um, and I watched the whole eight hours. I, I, yeah, I'm addicted to sports. It's pretty bad. Football, cricket, American football, baseball, basketball, tennis. When the Olympics comes on, I watch the swimming. I, so my whole thought process was I watch so much sports, why not get paid for it, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I can talk, so why not do that? So... Um, I went up, my uncle took me up to HTS, I interviewed, and then I, I got the position. Um, and it was a very interesting experience. Um, the first, when I got to HTS, there was no sports. There was no sports at the time. Okay. I didn't really have any help with it. <laughs> I walked into HTS there was a blank screen in front of me and whatever was on the sports that night did not exist that morning. Jeez. And I had, I had to do it on myself. Um, it was a little overbearing the first week, first two weeks. Cause I was, I don't know, 19, 20 years old. This is my first, like, you know, actual, actual job. Not only is it that it is a job in the public eye. Um, and I, I, I'm also a perfectionist, so everything had to be as close to, if not perfect. Um, so I would write these scripts up, and then we would record them, and we had to we try to record them in one take because you didn't want to cut and cut and cut. Yeah. And um, that first two weeks was like, whoa! I can I can I can I do this? And I started to figure it out. I did start to figure it out. I was very lucky. First week or so, I had the Australian Open in tennis. So I always had something. Always yeah. had. Every day, there was something. Um, for me, I, I watch so much international sports, which is it's easy to do that because, you know, there's always a stream or there's always... I'm, I'm, BBC Sports page is one of the bookmarks on my, on my laptop. Like, it's, it's <laughs> there. <laughs> I'm always on BBC looking at sports. Yeah. But my trouble early on was I didn't deeply follow a lot of things in St. Lucia, a lot of the sports going on in St. Lucia. Um, I, you know, was young and then you have to know where things are, when they are, and then you have to get there and stuff. So I was very, very lucky because before I worked at HCS, I had an internship at Vibe Radio um, on the banter and they have a, so it's a, a half an hour program every morning well weekday mornings from 7 30 to 8 where when i first got the the internship it was um elijah williams um midget whose name escapes michael midget pair there we go and the current um minister for youth development and sports and senior show kenson casimir and um i think it's youth development and sports i hope i haven't done that wrong (laughs) very good friends of mine yeah and they were tremendous. They were superb. They really helped me. When I got to HDS, Midget would send me his scripts for the for the news from the banter because there's a, a 15 minute sports news bit before the the live program starts. You know, right. where we just kind of talk about whatever. So he would send me that so that I had in, uh, national sports and regional sports. And then Kenson, who was working. Um, Oh my lord, I can't remember. But it's he was right. working at a at a, a rival 
you know, sports. Uh, he would take me to games in FIFA. We would go and watch uh, veterans and Black Heart. Mm-hmm. And he took me. He didn't have to do that. Yeah, you know, yeah. these guys didn't have to do that. They were superb and they still are. And, and they check on me and I, I, I you know, I, I see them when I can. And they really have been amazing for me and, and to me. And I'm very, very grateful. So when I got to HCS now, I, I had to stop going on the banter. It was, I had to exclusively be with HCS, but Kenton still took me to the games and Midget would send me scripts. Yeah. And it was a tremendous help. So I think about a month in, I started to get, I started to work out like a formula. Like I would do football first and then cricket or whatever. Yeah, um, yeah. And it, it became structured because yeah, in yeah. the beginning it was not structured. I didn't have, <laughs> I would just walk in, have a panic for about three hours and then work it all out. <laughs> so it became structured and it was, I was in a really, I was starting to get my groove. I was in a really good place. And then the pandemic hit. No sports. And I was just like, oh, wow. <laughs> Great. Now what do I do? Right. So HDS moved me from sports writing to news writing. And this is news writing for the newscast. Um, at the time, they brought back their 15-minute live lunch cast, lunch newscast. So uh, within the building, we called it the 45. It's, it's called the News 45 Major, I believe. Um, so for about a two weeks or so period of two weeks i believe winston springer jr who is the editor there was doing that while andre paul was reading the um obviously the night news then in march andre went on vacation springer read the night news and cool we got put on the lunchtime news (laughs) live lunchtime news that was an experience. That was an experience because up until then, now again, I've done live stuff before. I've, I've done theater. Yeah. I'm not bothered with being live, but sometimes things would be late. Um, we would have technical difficulties. And I, can, I understand that in, in a live atmosphere, you're going to encounter problems. I don't have a problem with people encountering problems. The difficulty comes when you encounter problems regularly um and it was it was difficult for me because i was the face of this newscast right Mm -hmm. i am who people are seeing i'm who people are hearing and when things go wrong i'm sitting there like a duck (laughs) a duck (laughs) on a lake just completely confused yeah don't know what's going on a lamb to the slaughter kind of (laughs) yeah and we had some difficult days we did but you know we, we we persevered um I actually read the news for the rest of my tenure at HDS, like the lunchtime news, the rest of my tenure at HDS. I think by the end of it, we were much more streamlined and, and uh, we had a, 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 a good package. It was, it was very good. Um, and it was enjoyed. It started to become enjoyable after we got over the stress at the beginning and, yeah. and just the, what's going on. <laughs> it, it, it became structured and, and, you know, I'd walk in, not panicking, script was there, get on set, work everything out, cool. So this is March, Andre comes back. I thought, okay, well then Springer's going to go back to the news. No, I read, like I said, I read news for the rest of the year. And then Andre got sick about the second week in April. So... I'm reading the news at lunchtime at this point. I'm writing about a story a day in, re- in replacement of the sports, right? Mm-hmm. So I walked into work. Um, I'm pretty sure it's a week after my birthday. I walked into work and Springer said to me, you're reading tonight. <laughs> I said, what? He said, yeah, Andre's sick. You're reading tonight. And I read for two months. Live news nice seven news. o'clock at night and and for the viewers and listeners that's prime time that's when everybody's looking right yes yeah, this... yeah and it's and i'm not sure about this i'm not certain how many other companies in st lucia are live i think most of them record their news mm-hmm. we were very very live like how this is live at this moment now when the viewers see this will be recorded but yeah. very very live so 
the first night went brilliantly. I mean, I killed it. Second night, we recorded it because Parliament was on. Thank goodness. Third night, third night. And this, I know this night has stuck with a lot of people because people have mentioned it to me. It's not fun. <laughs> so I got, I got to work. I read over the script. Um, and I changed the name. I had done it the first night, but I changed it from my name is Andre Paul to my name is Colby DeVoe because obviously. Um, save the new script, whatever. And somebody had to prompt it, put it on the teleprompter. So when I'm reading, teleprompter's right in front of the camera, right? So I read it yeah. looking at the camera. I get myself dressed, I get on the set, I'm reading the script. And so we both prompt and print the script. We print it just in case we have any technical difficulties. Sometimes things uh, aren't clear on the teleprompter. So you have to just read off the paper in front of you just to make sure everything's smooth. So I printed the correct script without my name on it, and the old script was prompted. So I'm reading, I'm reading, and because it's very good, I read the, the intro, uh, I'm sorry, and I was tuned on, I mean, I was tuned in. So I was like, okay, well, it says Andre Paul, that's not my name. So I said, you know, my name is Gold Beautiful. And get to the first story, and I said, and I said, because um, there's a little earpiece, so they yeah. can hey, they talk to you, and mm -hmm. then you have your mic on. So when whatever you say, uh, the people in production can hear you. Right. So I said, "This is the old script. We're gonna need a change." Somebody said, "Okay, we'll change it in the first break." Well, that didn't happen. <laughs> I can't remember if it was a hectic night or not because we did have some very hectic nights. We had some incredible, wild nights. I mean, I was I've been I've sat on set as the ads are finishing not knowing what story I'm going to read next because <laughs> things have just been all over the place and some stories haven't been edited in time. Some stories haven't come. Just... Live news is a very, very interesting thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I can't remember what happened that night. What I do remember very, very, very clearly is that I was, as I was reading the end, you're reading the outro, I'm just reading it. And for those two months, what I did was I read the entire outro, and I did it even later. Andre doesn't read the outro. He's, I think his outro is something of the sort of, that brings us to the end of the news. Thanks very much for joining. Uh, I'm Andre Paul, wishing you a safe night. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. It's very concise. Yeah, that sounds outro. familiar, yeah. Yeah, but I read the whole thing because I was a newbie. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> I was just like, well, it's there. I'm going to read it. Yeah. And I read... I'm Andre Paul. And my brain then went, no, you're not. That's not right. Um, <laughs> not right. And on live television, I went, oh, Lord. Um, I'm going to have a good night. And we ended it. And I died. I wanted to die that night. I really <laughs> did. I really did. I, I wanted to cry. I was so mad. <laughs> I was so mad. And after that, I prompted my script. I prompted my script every time. I let anybody else prompt my script because if that happened to me again, I would have probably cried on set. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, so, yeah, I read for two months and Andre came back. Okay. Um, sports started to come back. So I started to do sports and I was still doing the lunchtime news. And then Andre went on vacation in January and I read for January. And uh, and then, yeah, that was, that was the end of my contract. And, and then I started to look seriously to come to school. Okay. Uh, is, it, is it okay to ask what you may be studying now? Oh, I'm doing journalism at school, yeah. Okay. Definitely. Um, I came up to the school to do journalism. Um, that was another school I was looking at where I could have done sports journalism. But my thought was, let me start with all of journalism mm -hmm. and then go to sports journalism, you know? So okay. at least I have a foundation, a base. Uh, but I do know, like, I'm not doing political journalism. I don't find out who's doing <laughs> finance journalism. How boring is that? Yeah. You know, um, I think the year I spent in news, I don't want to do criminal journalism either. Hmm. Uh, news is, is very difficult to read or watch news today. Um, and, I, and I remember having conversations with people who would be like, you know, I was playing the depressing stuff. I just turned that off. And I'm like, oh, you're lucky. I can't turn it off. I'm sitting there live and it's happening. Mm -hmm. You know, um, had some horrid, absolutely horrid things happen in St. Lucia. And I just had to sit there and 
it's very difficult to remain like absolutely just composed, dead faced when you're hearing these, these horrid, horrid things. Um, I think one thing that I mean, at the end of the year, working at least, yes, I was burnt out. I did have, it was a lot. But on top of it being a lot with stress and stuff, I remember early doors uh, working at the company. We, you know, people would come in and be like, we've had a shooting or a death. And my reaction was, oh my God. Towards the end of the year, my reaction was another one. And one day, like, I heard myself say these words and I was like, Whoa, 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 that's not the reaction you can have. To, this is not the reaction you are allowed to have to somebody losing their life. Right. That, that's that's wrong. I'm sorry, you cannot be having this reaction. And that that frightened me because I'd only been there for a year. Can you imagine mm-hmm. working there for 10 years or 15 right. years? And I'm, I'm not saying particular or specifically, it's just, I just mean in general, just that, that all these, I mean, there's a lot of terrible stuff happening, but to constantly be hearing it and writing about it and, and listening it's it's rough it's real rough stuff yeah and, and that that echoes that echoes what amani told me on uh, my conversation with her regarding uh the effect that you know sh- having to digest and and mirror these stories to the public uh, mm-hmm. can take can take on you so yeah um, i'm sure it takes a toll yeah, definitely. I even up to very recently where I, I I don't know what it is now. I haven't asked yet, but I think St. Lucia's murder record was 60. I'm saying was because I have a I have a very nagging feeling it's been broken this year. Yeah. It was 60. And I was talking to Soda Alfred, who still works at HDS, good friend of mine. In fact, I'm still in, in communication with a lot of the people at HTS, really, really cool people. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was talking to her one night and I asked her, I said, what is the count now? And it was 58. And that night, um, the Bell Gabriel got shot, it became 59. And um, he worked at HTS. We didn't work together. He was there before me, mm-hmm. but he'd also worked with her at a different place. And the next morning, I checked on her. I, I, I pretty much checked on everybody I could. And everybody was, you know, rattled very, very badly. And they should have been. It was an absolute atrocity. But I just remember her specifically being, it really hit her very, very hard. And I could only imagine, you know, what that must have been like to then have to turn around and and report this. It was difficult for me being in a completely different country, mm-hmm. hearing about it. And I wasn't particularly close to him. Okay. I mean, I knew him. He went to the same school as me. We, if I saw him in public, we'd, we'd say hi or whatever. But it was, I could not imagine what she was going through, the fact that she'd worked with him. They seemed really cool with each other, good friends and stuff. And then she she had to go out, talk to his dad, come back. I don't think she wrote the story. Um, and I was I was happy that she didn't. Because I, I it takes a lot to be a news writer these days because there's so much atrocities happening, so many atrocities happening. But I was I don't know what writing that would do. To some, you know, you can you imagine you've you had this good friend and they and they're murdered and you have to sit there and write the story out. I, I don't know. And so he was fifty nine, and I'm. It's sad to say, but I'm fairly certain they've gone past sixty now. You know. Yeah. Um. And I know this isn't. We're not exactly qualified political analyst or no. anything of the sort but just off the top of your head what where, where, where do you think or where do you see this spike in violence coming from i i really don't know i don't i don't know i'm not going to pretend that i i have an answer for you i don't um yeah i i kind of live sheltered at home so I've not 
I don't go out and I don't see a lot of the stuff happening. I, I don't see a lot of the, the problems that face a lot of people, you know, my age, our age, a kind of generation. I'm not going to sit here and proffer on other people's struggles and problem. Right. Um, it, I'm sh I know it must be extremely difficult what some people are going through. Um, I just wish, and I know so many people say it, they always say it. It's like, there must be a different way, a better way to handle things than just going out and murdering people. It's true. Mm -hmm. There has to be, you know, um, the lack of respect or reverence for life that, that we see sometimes is truly frightening. It's truly frightening. Um, so I, I don't know what it is. I wish I knew what it was. I'm not going to sit here and it's like some people just say, oh, it's the drugs. Or, mm -hmm. Different things affect different people differently, you know. Um, so there are some things and everybody has their own struggle. The way some people deal with their struggle is differently. And it's just, it's very sad to see especially a lot of young men. There's a lot of young men who are, who are encountering this situation, you know, encountering these violent ends on our island. It's, it's, yeah, it's sad. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think, I, I, first of all, I have to say that I don't know either. Um, mm -hmm. But if I were to speculate, I actually made a, a short skit sort of, um sketch where i tried to package some of the reasons um that i think it could be coming from i think a lot of it is frustration um guys leave school they did not do well in school uh yeah. they don't know what they could do uh and they're frustrated you know yeah. and that frustration and boredom idleness yeah. leads to dark paths right yeah you know and um unfortunately you have peer pressure and bad friends that can mm -hmm. take you down some really dark places and you know i'm really sorry to hear about um that individual um to them, yeah. yeah who lost his life um but i hope that we can do better and that we will do better, but as, yeah. as, as a people, as a St. Lucian people, a Caribbean people, we have to put our heads together in order to do so, right? Yeah. Um, so it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Oh, wait, let me just, just let me make sure I get the name right, because if this comes out and Kenty sees that I got the name wrong, she will <laughs> probably slap me. <laughs> um, but yes it has been absolutely wonderful and uh, it was a pleasure an absolute pleasure um, I hope that I answered the questions the way you wanted well no absolutely you got some of the answers you wanted. but real quick just before we hop out of the door yeah no um, you established that you love sports right mm -hmm. you never actually said why I um honestly I don't I think this is another thing for me is I have a, a really a great family. I'm very, very, very grateful for that. Um, my grandfather also loves sports. Okay. I think subconsciously, maybe subconsciously, it was just a way for me to connect with him. Um, I mean, the same way I was watching cricket last night, he was watching cricket last night. <laughs> I know he was watching cricket last night. It's, it's one of those things where um, my, my parents, my grandfather, my grandparents, my parents kind of pushed us to do sports because they wanted to, us to have an outlet, you know, to get rid of a bunch of energy, you know. Right, right. So all my brothers play football. I play tennis. I didn't really enjoy being bumped into. So I liked tennis. I was by myself. <laughs> um, the other thing I liked about tennis was that the only person I can get mad at is me. The only person who can fix the problems is me. Mm. And I'm not saying that like a cocky person. It's just like, if I play well, then I'm playing well. It's like, if, if I'm making stupid mistakes, the only person who can fix it is me. I don't have yeah. to, I, I will not be upset at somebody else because yeah, you know, yeah. they don't pass the ball or something. Like that. Um, 
but sports, I don't know. I, I, I just always love to watch sports. I watch football and talk about them, debate them, discuss them. I have a cousin. I love him, but he's wrong. Lionel Messi is the greatest footballer of all time. <laughs> he thinks it's Cristiano Ronaldo, and he's wrong. At we always fight over this stuff. Uh, my gra- my grandfather and I have a rule: we can never support the same team, person, whatever. So in tennis, he likes Federer. I like Nadal. Football, he likes Liverpool. I like Manchester United. Cricket, he likes England. I don't know why. And I like well, he's a he's a massive West Indian fan. Obviously, West Indies first. Yeah. But then he also likes England. Me, on the other hand, um, I don't have time for the West Indies. I am uh, Australian. <laughs> and um, I, I can say that because I've said it on air already. So that's fine. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, I back the Aussies ridiculously hard. Uh, but it's, it's, I don't know, it's like a thing. It's just a thing we, we come together. We always watch like the tennis together, always like the Grand Slam finals. I go by him and we watch them together. And we needle each other constantly, sit down next to each other. We sit next to each other and pick fights with each other the whole time. <laughs> and then at the end of it, we analyze it together. Everybody's in a good mood and we go home and we go on. It, I don't know, maybe it's that. I think my other grandfather who I, I never met also, apparently, another sports junkie. Like maybe it's just genetically it's come through. My father doesn't like sports too much, but then I love them I, too much. I watch too much sports. <laughs> um, I remember there was one time we were talking about maybe me going to school in Australia. And I was like, I'd love to, but I will fail. Because I will go to all the cricket. I don't care. <laughs> I will just be there. I'd be like, where are you? You're supposed to be in class. I am in cricket class. Yeah, that's where I am. <laughs> I am fine. So, I mean, I have a, a list of all the sporting events I want to go to. I want to go to a World Cup final. I want to go to a Euros final. I want to go to the Grand Slams. I have to go and watch cricket in Australia and in England. I, I want to go to a Super Bowl. I want to go and watch all these things. Um, I don't know. It, it gave me in the same way, like my dad plays guitar. So sometimes um, if I ever want to spend time with him, I would just go and sit in the living room with a guitar and start playing. Mm. And five, 10 minutes later, he would go get his and we'll sit there and play together in a half an hour, 45 minutes. We don't speak, but we have that. Mm-hmm. I think with my grandfather, it's, it's that thing where I have the cricket I have these sports with him. Mm-hmm. So I'll go and sit down next to him and, and we watch these sports together. And um, it's just, maybe it's just, it's just that. It's just a way for me to connect with somebody. Um, and then on top of that, then I just got hooked. And yeah, now my mother, my mother has followed my grandfather. She supports teams that frustrate me. Mm-hmm. It's very annoying. Um, <laughs> And my little brother as well, and my youngest brother. So, you know, he's very competitive, bless his soul. And we just have this, I have a really, I have a great family. That's Um, a blessing. It is, it really is. And it's it's also great that, you know, because for for years my mother would catch me on YouTube. You know, as you do, every time you're studying, you study, you study, you study. As soon as you go on YouTube, they pass by every time. (laughs) It's like, yes, yeah, you could not come here like 10 minutes ago. <laughs> um, but every time she'd come back, she'd catch me watching some sports. She's like, boy, do your work. I, mm-hmm. I just remember when I was working at HDS, the first week I was working at HDS, she came out into the living room because I was watching tennis. It's like 2 o'clock in the morning. Right? She comes out into the living room and she goes, you must be so happy. I'm like, yeah, I am doing my work. What now? <laughs> you can't tell me go and do work. This is my work. I was yeah, yeah. so happy. Um, it's just it's great. I have a really great family, and I'm so very blessed and so very lucky. Um, yeah, they have been tremendous because when when I then say to my parents, "Well, I want to go and do sports journalism," I never got what. Of all things, it was like, "Yeah, okay, go on then. We'll help you." We will help you to do what you want to do because, I mean, they they know sports is my, I watch so much sports. And that was another thing I remember at the end of my tenure at HDS. 
I remember there was a point where sports was no longer fun. And I knew that something was wrong. Yeah. That's a sign of burnout, right? <clears throat> I was like, how could, how could this suddenly feel? Like sports, sports was a place when I was stressed or whatever, I would just go there. Sports and music. That's what guitar started to fill. And I was working and, and sports was suddenly no longer fun. I was just like, this is wrong. This is very wrong. Like, I know this is what I want to do, but something about this particular thing is wrong. And, and I, I was just like, I'm burnt out. I am burnt out because I came out to do sports and I ended up doing a multitude of other things, getting myself involved with the depressing news. And now on top of that, I had the, the stress of going to school and trying to figure that out. And it was rough. It was... I just was like, what am I doing? How am I not enjoying this anymore? Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I, I stopped. I mean, my contract was up. And now I have exams and I'm plotting my way around my studying for my exams and watching sports. <laughs> <laughs> it's, back to where, it's back to where it should be. And I'm happy about that. Yeah, um, yeah so it's youth specializing in performing and culture. Whew. Okay. And, and this is a, a group based in St. Lucia, right? Yes. All right. And um, yeah. who, I joined who them on, put it together? Was, so, well, that's, a, that's a complete, another story. This group's been around for about a decade, 11 years or so. Um, it first came from SPAC, which was Students Performing Arts Company. Um, it was a summer program. Uh, I believe it was the brainchild of Miss Petronilla de Turville, Miss Cantilia Louis. Um, I'm probably missing a few people there. I think Drenia Frederick might have been one as well. Um, I, I'm definitely missing a few names and I, I'm apologizing for that. But out of that, I think there were two groups that branched out of that. One, which eventually became Youth Spark. Cantelia Louis is the managing director today. She has always been. But the way she tells the story, and another individual I know from the group they tell the story is uh, this group was, it transitioned from a summer program to about a yearly program, but it was mm -hmm. only for students, you know, secondary school students. And the second batch of secondary school students decided they wanted to keep acting. They liked it, they enjoyed it, and therefore they convinced Kentelia to make this into a group, not just for secondary students. So um, she's the managing director, my friend, Anthony Wilkie. He's part of what is called, they call themselves the founding members because they decided along with Kentelia that they wanted to keep doing this and to make this into a, a full-time group, I suppose. Um, yeah. And it's, it, for me, it was a, a truly amazing place. I joined, like I said, when I was in Sartre. And uh, it was really cool to find a lot of people. And that's when I say, when I mean, I know some people who are shy and then get on stage and work really well. Some of these yeah. guys, like me, <laughs> just like, we don't like people. They're terrifying. <laughs> They're terrifying. Right. Um, but it, it's really been a, a wonderful atmosphere. I'm very comfortable there. Um, but not in like a lazy comfortable because they've, they're constantly pushing you to keep trying things, keep working, keep working. But it's a really nice, it's a great setting. And I've, it, along with, you know, like my family and, and a few other things, it's one of the pillars for me today. And I'm very, very grateful for it. Yeah, I, I want to, yeah, definitely shout out to them. Um, if you can share with me their Facebook page or yeah, anything along those lines. Uh, we had annual pictures. We always we always want to support the performing arts in St. Lucia and the Caribbean in general. Right. And um, I'm very encouraged to hear that that group exists. So I'm yeah, really happy to hear about great. it. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it from me. Do you have any questions for me before we head out? No, I don't think so. It's just uh, very interested to see this movie final bit when it comes out what's gonna happen to it how how hard do i have to hide <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm planning all of this already it's like hmm, so i'm gonna need to have, find a bunker 
you know, about three months supply of food. <laughs> I, I don't know if that would help. I think people would still find you, man. <laughs> uh, is it okay for like, now that I've called you Colby, right? Can mm-hmm. I start calling you Jean-Claude? Like I've always been yeah, doing. Man. Yeah, man. Right. Go ahead, man. That's so fine. for some I, people, I will always be Jean-Claude. Yeah. So you're I'm already Jean-Claude to, to me. <laughs> You don't know it yet, but you're already just called to me. So, yeah, I'm going to be calling you that as I have been. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, man, I'm really excited. Uh, folks, you, I'm excited for you guys to see this as well. We are working our very hardest to get this out the door. Um, so I'm really, I'm also excited for your future uh, career in sports Thank journalism. And I hope to see you, continue to see you on the big screen, continue to see you doing theater, and um, guys, I know I promised you guys uh, that we would be back last week, if, if I'm correct. As you can see, there's been some stuff going on. Um, but the vid, the vid <laughs> the vid strikes again. The vid struck. Um, and, you know, but we have, we have stuff in the pot. There's stuff cooking. And uh, just hang in there. Stay tuned. And uh, I'll see you guys uh, in the next two weeks. All right. Jacques Claude. Have a good also one, known as Thanks for having me on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me on. It's been a pleasure. All right, man. Have a good one. You too.